first of all for that prayer and uh, we're very uh, grateful and we're thankful for the Lord allowing us to have another time of study and uh, another time to get together to just uh, share his word. Today we're looking at Exodus chapter 37 and um, as I had said about this portion of scripture, um, this portion of scripture is really just like reading the, uh, you know, the ingredients like a recipe book, um, it, it, it's it's not full of drama. It don't have a whole lot of plot twists and things that can cause you to find it a very uh, stimulating reading. But uh, it is yet important, and it's stuff that we need to know. Now today, um, we're going to continue on getting the description of how God gave to. Uh, Beziel and all of those that he uh, put the wisdom on how to build the items of the tabernacle and are they going to begin to just continue that work. But before we do that, <clears throat> I think it would be helpful since we're dealing with this and I probably should have did it last week too, but at least we're going to do it this week. Let's go and make sure, because sometimes you say, well, Wayne, you have compared all this stuff to things like our body and Christ's body. Where do you get that from? And I think it's important to see that I'm not just kind of making it out of the thin air, that this is something that applies. So let's go to another portion of Scripture. Let's go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. All right. And we're just going to read a couple of passages there. Hello, Calvin. Uh, so we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 really quick. And I just want to point out a couple of things so that we know that this association of this tabernacle to us um, in all of its facets, and it all speaks to a variety of different things, it's, it's important to know that that's a reality. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and um, let's take a look at the very first verse. Hey, bro. Yes. Does everybody have it? We want to give everybody a chance. Some mm. people will, you know, they're not getting it fast enough. We no. want to make sure people are getting the word. All right. Well, we're on 2 Corinthians, and if you need to jot it down, make sure you the way you know. And we're going to take a look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Hopefully everyone has that. If you don't have it, say ouch. All right. And uh, the first verse, it says, for we know. And first of all, let me just say, this is Paul speaking. and He's talking to the Corinthian church. He said, for we know. Now, that's an important thing. He, he didn't say for we think or we guess. He said, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle. Now, we can pause and stop right there. Look what he's saying. If our earthly house of this tabernacle, so he now is describing our earthly body as a tabernacle, and a tabernacle is a place that is set aside for the opportunity for God to dwell and to meet you in. So Paul's describing our natural body as a place that God says, I can meet you right there. Where? Where? in your own presence, in your own person, in your own body. Let's keep reading. Paul says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, in other words, it's what? Removed, taken away, or died. Uh, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands. So what, that, what Paul is saying is, I'm not worried about what happens to this tabernacle, this earthly tabernacle, because I know I have another tabernacle that was not made by the hands of man. Now, when we go back to Exodus, we're going to read about a tabernacle that was instructed and given to man by God, but it was made by what? Earthly hands. So, but he's saying, I know we have another tabernacle that man didn't build. That's a tabernacle that God built. He says, uh, a building of God, a house not made of hands, eternal in the heavens. This tabernacle is where? It has access to heavenly and spiritual places that this particular tabernacle that we currently live in does not have. 
And he says, in, verse, in, the, in the second verse, he says, for in this we groan. Now, he says, and this causes us some pain. Why? Because we are in this earthly tabernacle that can't access all the things that we know are there in the spiritual. Uh, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our tabernacle, which is from heaven. So even while we're yet alive, we recognize the anguish and the frustration that this earthly tabernacle limits us to. That we can't have the fullness of what God has prepared yet. But it is a promise. And it is something that we will get. All right? So we think about Abraham when we think about that. How he was promised that he would get it. But he had to what? He had to wait. Look at verse 3. So, it says, If so be that we clothe, we shall be found what? Naked. So, if we are clothed, we will not be found what? Naked. Now, that goes back to speak to the original issue. Why do we need a tabernacle? Because initially, what happened in the garden? We sinned, and whatever covering we had, whatever covering Adam and Eve had, was dissolved. And they then noticed that they were what? Naked. So they removed the original tabernacle that they had. However it was, however God formed it, we don't get no real detailed information on that initial and original tabernacle, which allowed Adam and Eve to relate to God, because the tabernacle is a place where God will what? Meet you. So when that one was dissolved, they were found, they were found naked. So he says, so, so we don't want to be found naked. Look at verse 4. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed. It's not so much that I want to get rid of this tabernacle and have nothing. I want to exchange it. Look what he says. Uh, that we should be unclothed, but clothed. I want to be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up uh, of life. What is that saying? So that our earthly tabernacle that we currently have, which is already been told is going back to the what? To the dust. Will be exchanged or changed for an eternal tabernacle that will be with God forever. So when we talk about tabernacles, it's important to keep in mind, and what I'm going to do now, I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but I'm also going to just mention in Exodus, not Exodus, in Genesis chapter 3. After uh, Adam and Eve had eaten from the fruit of the tree of, uh, 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 of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, that their eyes were open, they recognized that they were naked, they began to do what? Try to clothe themselves. And I want to point out a couple of things. The fruit that was for, the forbidden fruit was on a what? Tree. Tree. All right, we want to keep that in mind. It was a forbidden fruit. It wasn't forbidden diamonds. It wasn't forbidden rubies. It wasn't forbidden water. It was forbidden fruit, which came from a what? A tree. We're going to see that again in, this, in our Exodus study. And when they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, God moved them out, and then he put a guard there. And that guard was what? Two cherubim with flaming swords to guard the way so that they could not find or get back to the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that particular place in which there was fellowship with God has been cut off. Now God says, in order for me to fellowship with you, I have to come to you what? Personally. All right? And therefore, we need a what? We need a tabernacle. So when we go through this, now we're going to go back to Exodus chapter 37. When we go through all of this and we're seeing all this, and sometimes, like I said, it can be very boring reading. But if you look at it from a spiritual aspect and you bring it into your um, actions and your relationship with God, it can then add some drama. It can add some excitement. It can, can become more than just, you know, an, an instruction on how to build a coffee table. It's, it's how you build yourself and how you build uh, and how God wants you to relate and to and to react with Him, all right. 
Uh, any comments or questions on that? All right. We're going to go now to our reading. Let me uh, bring this up. I should have had it up already. And let's take a look at Exodus chapter 37. Let's take a listen. Chapter 37. And Bezaliel made the ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it, and a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height of it. And he overlaid it with pure gold within and without, and made a crown of gold to it round about. And he cast for it four rings of gold to be set by the four corners of it, even two rings upon the one side of it, and two rings upon the other side of it. And he made staves of shittim wood, and overlaid them with gold. And he put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark to bear the ark. And he made the mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half was the length thereof, and one cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And he made two cherubims of gold, beaten out of one piece made he them, on the two ends of the mercy seat. One cherub on the end on this side, and another cherub on the other end on that side. Out of the mercy seat made he the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims spread out their wings on high, and covered with their wings over the mercy seat, with their faces one to another, even to the mercy seatward were the faces of the cherubims. And he made the table of sheeting wood. Two cubits was the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And he overlaid it with pure gold, and made thereunto a crown of gold round about. Also he made thereunto a border of an handbreadth round about. And he made a crown of gold for the border thereof round about cast for it four rings of gold, and put the rings upon the four corners that were in the four feet thereof. Over against the border were the rings, the places for the staves to bear the table. And he made the staves of sheeting wood, and overlaid them with gold to bear the table. And he made the vessels which were upon the table, his dishes and his spoons, and his bowls and his covers to cover withal of pure gold. And he made the candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work made he the candlestick, his shaft and his branch, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers were of the same. And six branches going out of the sides thereof, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side thereof, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side thereof. Three bowls made after the fashion of almonds in one branch, a knop and a flower, and three bowls made like almonds in another branch, a knop and a flower. So throughout the six branches going out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick were four bowls made like almonds, his knops and his flowers and the knob under two branches of the same, and the knob under two branches of the same, and the knob under two branches of the same, according to the six branches going out of it. Their knobs and their branches were of the same. All of it was one beaten work of pure gold. And he made his seven lamps and his snuffers and his snuff dishes of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold made he it, and all the vessels thereof. And he made the incense altar of sheeting wood, the length of it was a cubit, and the breadth of it a cubit, it was four square, and two cubits was the height of it. The horns thereof were of the same. And he overlaid it with pure gold, both the top of it, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns of it. Also he made unto it a crown of gold round about. And he made two rings of gold for it under the crown thereof, by the two corners of it, upon the two sides thereof to be places for the staves to bear it with all. And he made the staves of shitty wood, and overlaid them with gold. And he made the holy anointing oil, the pure incense of sweet spices, according to the work of the apothecary. All Chapter right. 37. And Bezaliel made the ark of shitting wood. All right, there we go. So, now, we see here this uh, description, which gives us a flavor of the items that were in the ark of covenant. I should say the, uh, let me say that, let me, let me say that a better way. We see the items that were in the tabernacle. All right, one of those items happened to be the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. Um, I, but there were many here that we see uh, mentioned. Now, um, we could just say, okay, uh, we could end this chapter and just say, well, Moses uh, uh, and, and, um, and was instructed to build, and God gave the instructions on the wisdom to build to Beziel and to those that were wise-hearted, and they built the items. And we could be done. That could be it. Because that's basically what the chapter is talking about. They actually made what God instructed them to make through uh, the word given to uh, God through Moses. But I think it's important that we do take our time 
and go through this and try to bring relevance to why the, the Word of God would spend so much time giving detail about these items. See, to me, when God's Word takes the time to give all of this detail, when we go back to Genesis and God made the heavens and the earth, how did he describe it? He said, God, what? Made the heavens and the earth. And that was pretty much it. He didn't give us no details about, you know, the compensation of what the sun was made out of, how it was made out of uh, uh, helium and any kind of uh, 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 fusion that was going on that allowed the sun to burn. We didn't get any of those details. Why didn't we get any details about how the sun works, about why the, the, the moon and the planets rotated around the sun? He just said he created it. Now, he could have said the same thing about this. They made the stuff, but he didn't. He gave detail. And so, therefore, the word of God is it's no coincidence. There's no serendipity. And there's no just accidental, you know, well, the word just happened to talk about that. No, it's a purposeful uh, 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 written article for God uh, to give to us that we would get some insight in our relationship with him. And that's why we got chapter after chapter after chapter about this tabernacle, which most people, when they try to read, fall asleep. All right? But let's take a look. Let's go back to verse 1. All right? And it says, And Beziel made the ark. All right? So we need to stop right there. What are we talking about? We're talking about the ark of the covenant. All right? And this is an important piece because this is the only piece of furniture that is in a certain part of the tabernacle, which we call the Holy of Holies. Okay? So remember, the tabernacle consists of the entire courtyard. All right? And in the courtyard, there was the, uh, uh, the brazen uh, uh, altar. There was uh, the, burnt or the, the, the burnt altar, altar where they could sacrifice the animals at. So one at one thing in the courtyard was for the sacrifice. The other one was for the washing, the brazen, the, 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 the bronze uh, um, basin, I should say. I said brazen. I, mean, I should call it bronze. The bronze basin where the water was. Then you went into another area that was cordoned off by curtains and different things. And then you went into the holy place. And in there, there were some items which we're going to describe in just a bit. And then in the next section that was cordoned off by some more curtains, which we call the veil, was the Holy of Holies. There is where this particular item is. This item is the Ark. And this is, we often uh, have it, uh, see it called the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and uh, the Ark of the Covenant is made of several things, which we will take a look at here. All right, so first of all, it's made of, of shit and wood. All right. And it, it gives us a description, and it says you're going to make it uh, 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 the size-wise. And, it, and it's, it's given the length, the breadth, and the height of it. So it's given us the three-dimensional measurements of this Ark of the Covenant. All right? And you can see those there. Now, I think it's important to keep in mind that it is three-dimensional. Uh, that means it speaks to our, re our reality. All right? our, our, our reality is... Is multi-dimensional. We got we, we got front, back, left, right, up and down, and this art covers all of that. And in the description, it speaks about these three dimensions. Then you can say, "Well, I don't mean yes, they're just telling you the, the shape of it." And that's true, it is. But it also speaks to it speaks to all of us and all of our our ways in this earthly realm. You see, in the heavenly realm, there may be dimensions of reality that we don't know about that we're not aware of. Remember when John said he was caught up into heaven? Well, he uses the word up, but which way, which direction did he go? I think he went into a direction that we don't know about, another dimension. And that's why heaven is considered greater than our dimension. Our dimension is, lo is located and, and confined to our three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Whereas heaven has multiple dimensions uh, uh, realities that we don't even uh, perceive or comprehend yet. 
But this Ark of the Covenant speaks to our reality. It's got three dimensions. It's got length, breadth, and height. All right? So he, he says we're going to make it. And it's made of shit and wood. But then in verse 2, it says, but we're going to overlay it with pure gold. Okay? Which is important to keep in mind. That the outer piece of it is more valuable than the inner piece. The inner piece is what gives it st stability, and you can build upon it. But the outer piece is what gives it the what? The shine and the, and the, and the gleam. Um, and so it's made out of what? Pure gold. And I think that's important to keep in mind as well because it's supposed to be something that when you look upon it, you look upon it and go, wow. But the inner part of it, the part that actually gives it the stability, doesn't have the same glow. Now, immediately, who do I think about? I think about Jesus. All right? Because Jesus was talked about as being the individual that when you were to look upon him, you, there was what? You would see no beauty, like the shit would. But when he showed his what? His glory. Remember when he went on the mountain of transfiguration and he was transfigured and he showed his, his full glory? And then Moses and Elijah was there with him. So it's a, there's a lot there. Uh, when you think about how that's put together, then it all re reflects upon how uh, our Lord is. Also, keeping in mind us, we now, as Paul said when we went over to 2 Corinthians, we are in this earthly tabernacle, but we're going to have another tabernacle that will be more glorious than the one that we're currently in. And so a lot of these things speak to that. Um, and uh, like I had said previously, uh, there's probably other things that, that it speaks to that refers in other portions of Scripture that I'm just not clever enough to point out. But I'm thinking that, that you should always keep yourself open that when you're reading Scripture that you may be able to get some uh, uh, aha moments when the Lord shows you this also relates to that too. And that's why it's important to read the Word. Because if you read the Word, you'll be like, wow, you know what? I see this connects to that. And the Word becomes alive. And it becomes very, very uh, 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 exciting. And, and, and you just look forward to reading it. All right, let's keep going. Verse 3. And he cast for it four rings. Now, what we're going to see in verse 3 and in verse 4, he's making these rings. Then he's going to make these staffs. All right, so the rings were made of what? Of gold. Uh, and he's going to put the rings on the four corners. And in verse 4, he says he's going to make these staffs. These staffs were initially made of shit and wood, but they're also what? Overlaid with gold. Okay? Now, what are the rings and the, and the staffs for? See, that's because this particular tabernacle is portable. You got to take it with you where? Everywhere you go. So, in order to take it, you're not supposed to touch or handle the holiness of God. So, rather than touching the, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, you then would take the staffs and thread them through the rings and then lift up the, the Ark that way, and that's how you carry it. But the key is God made preparations for us for them to take this with them everywhere you go. Now, does that speak to us? Of course it does. No matter where you go, you got to bring the Lord with you. But you got to bring him with you in your attitude, in your thinking. See, the rings and the shit and wood that you have is in your intentions, in your desires. So these rings and the staffs speak to our willingness to present and to bring God with us. See, some people have God, but they're not, I'm not bringing him. They, they forget to attach the rings and they forget to bring the stats so that I can bring God with me no matter whether I'm at work. I can bring him with me if I'm at home. I can bring him with me when I'm out entertaining, when I'm, whatever I'm doing. And so, But you got to make sure that you have that. And that speaks to that. All right? Don't leave him there uh, in, in, in the wilderness, bring him with you because they're on their way to the land of what? 
Amen. Milk and honey. Milk and honey. Amen. So you gotta make sure you bring them with you. Yes. All right. Don't don't say, well, I got milk and honey, and I don't need God. Mm. Mm -mm. Bring God with you, Amen. and that's what these rings and these staffs point to and show forth. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, in the verse five, it says that he uh, put the staffs in the rings beside the side of the ark uh, to bear to bear the ark. And that just brings out what I just said. That's the purpose of it is so you can bear it or to carry it. Verse 6. And he made the mercy seat of pure gold. All right. The mercy seat. What is the mercy seat? Well, technically, the mercy seat and the ark are the same thing, but they're different. The ark is the container or the chest. Then we got the measurements for that. And then the mercy seat is the lid or the top that goes on top of the chest. All right. And I find it interesting that in the Holy of Holies, you're going to see the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, there's going to be some items. We'll see that later. But I'll just let you know. You're going to see uh, some manna, that, that, that food that God used to feed the, the children of Israel, is going to be placed in there. You're also going to see the tablets that Moses received, which we already went through. Those are going to be placed in there once it's, it's, it's built. And then also a, uh, the rod that Aaron carried that was supposed to be a dead piece of wood, but then it, it budded and grew almonds. Um, that's going to go in there. All right? And that goes in the container, the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the Ark of the Covenant, the lid, that's what is considered the, the mercy seat. Now, all those things speak about God. And I find it interesting that in the Holy of Holies, we have something in there which is called mercy. So in the whole makeup, that's where you see the, the, the true essence of God. And we could talk about the tablets of stone that have the Ten Commandments, God's word. We could talk about the manna, God's sustaining life. You need that manna in order to what? To sustain, to life. See, God can live by himself. He don't need anything to live. God don't need to eat. He don't need to breathe. He don't need to do anything. And he is still what? God. We need something to be able to be who we are. And God says, what you need, I have and I provide. And that's what the manna speaks of. The, uh, the rod that budded speaks of God being the God that can take that which is dead and still give it what? Life. Ooh. But then on top of that, the thing that covers that is a, is a seat which he calls mercy. And why mercy? Because he's dealing with man that initially did what? What, what do we see in Genesis chapter 3? Sin. He sent. Man sent. So in order for God to be able to deal with man, he has to have what? Mercy. Mercy. Now, we're going to get to another part as to why there absolutely has to be mercy in just a bit. But let's let's stick with the mercy for a minute. What that means is, I'm not going to give you the punishment. I'm not going to give you what you deserve for your wrongdoings. That's what mercy speaks of. Right? There's a whole other thing called grace, which we'll, we'll talk about at another time. Grace means I'm going to give you something you didn't earn. But more important is that I don't get the punishment that I deserve. Mm. And that's what mercy. And so what it's saying is that in the Holy of Holies, the part that makes up God is his mercy. And that's something that sometimes we overlook and we forget. God is a merciful God. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he will find a way to unite that which has alienated himself from him. And God did it by allowing him in, his, in the personage of Jesus to take on and pay for sin. Therefore, that's how mercy was properly addressed. See, he just couldn't overlook sin. Sin had to be what? Properly dealt with. So that he could apply what? The mercy. And God did that because he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we can continue with that. So in verse 6, we see the mercy seat. And it's made of pure gold. It ain't got no shit and wood in it. It ain't got none of that. It's just pure gold. All right. Now, look what it says. It's, and it gives it dimensions. Two cubits and a half uh, are the length of it. 
and it gives the breadth of it and so forth, and it lets us know that it has dimension as well. Look at verse 7. And he made two cherubim of gold, beaten out of one uh, piece, made he them on two ends of the mercy seat. All right, one cherubim on, on this side and the other cherubim on the other side, on that side, out of, on the, of the mercy seat. All right, so he has two cherubim that were uh, formed out of pure gold that was, that was, that was made to put, to put on the mercy seat. Okay, so now, and, and we'll, we'll see here in a minute that the cherubim are, were made to face each other, looking towards each other, but also looking down at the mercy seat. And the wings cover. All right, now, we could spend time and we could go to, to Ezekiel, or we could go to Isaiah, or we could go to different places, uh, and we could see these individuals, these beings, as uh, Ezekiel and as Isaiah saw them, and even John in Revelation, when he saw them. And he said the, the, when they, the description that, are, that is given is that they continuously proclaim the holiness of God. They stay in the presence of God and they cry out continuously, holy, holy, holy. They just, they're, 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 their residence of being is to bring the holiness of God. Um, when you go into a field that, that has a bunch of roses in it, and you're there. You can see the roses, but you also can do what? Smell, Smell them. them. They, they have a aroma about them that when you are in the presence, you just can't, you can't help but notice it. Well, that's what cherubim do. You can't be in the presence of cherubim without experiencing and noticing the holiness of God. Mm -hmm. They are like the incense of holiness. They, they proclaim holiness. They are like the light of holiness. Mm -hmm. They are like the word of holiness. All they do is show forth. It's a, they're creatures that can just radiate how holy God is. Mm -hmm. Now, God made these beings so that his holiness could be somewhat understood, which we can. But the beauty of it is, if God is that holy, how can we find any room for sinful man? Because the cherubims sit on top of what? The mercy, the mercy seat. See, if it wasn't for the mercy seat, man would have no hope. We, Because the, the cherubims tell us God is only holy. And so what that means is there's no wrong. There's no error. There's no spot. There's no wrinkle. There's no there's no deformity. There's no uh, 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 thing that is out of line at all in God. God is completely perfect. But if he's like that, how can he then associate with man that is full of spots and wrinkles? And that's what the devil was counting on. See, Satan was counting on, if I can get man to just to get a spot, get a blemish, get a wrinkle in his character, God will have to separate himself from man, and he and man will never have association. But what Satan didn't understand was the depth of God's love that was full of his mercy, and he made a way. So Satan thought he had man in the same situation that he was in, but God's like, no. Glory, hallelujah. I have a way mm -hmm. to bring man back. Thank you. Satan's not coming back Thank because you. Satan is God. Satan Thank is the pure <laughs> just he's the father of uh, of mm. lies and, and, and hate and, and and all of that. Mm. But God says that well he recognized that we were manipulated, as mm. the woman said. Mm. The, ser the serpent the serpent beguiled me yes. and I did sin. See, I didn't sin, God, because I don't like you. I didn't sin because I hate you. I sinned because the serpent beguiled me. Mm -hmm. And then the minute I did sin, I was ashamed. Mm -hmm. That's why man can come back. Mm -hmm. Satan sinned and was proud of it. Mm -hmm. 
He don't want all he wants is to be, he wants to take God's place. Adam and Eve just were ashamed and were didn't want to be in the presence of God because they recognized what I have become doesn't match God's holiness. Oh, Jesus. And they tried to hide themselves. My God. But then the Lord says, I, I, I have a way. Mm -hmm. I have you, a way. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And he began, Jesus. He began mm. to unveil and unravel his way. And that's what we're kind of looking at here. God be the glory. All right. So, we continue on here. And he says that, um, so these cherubims, and he talks about how they're, they're built and they got their wings pointing towards each other. We talked about that. That's in verse 9. Verse 10. And he made a table of shitting wood, uh, two cubits was the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a half a cubit the height thereof. Okay, once again, now we got this table. And this table, now we have gone outside of the Holy of Holies, if we're looking at the tabernacle. We're no longer in the Holy of Holies. Now the table is in the holy place. Okay? Um, the only thing in the ho Holy of Holies is the... Ark of the Covenant, which is made up of the, the ark chest, the mercy seat, and the cherubim. But it's all one thing. Now, outside, we're past that veil. We're on the other side of the veil, and we have now the holy place. And now we put this table. And this, this is uh, basically the table of showbread. And we're going to uh, look at this, and we see that this table um, uh, is... is uh, Overlaid with pure gold. Uh, we see that in verse 11. And in verse 12 it says, Also he made thereupon the borders uh, of a hand breadth around it. So around this table, there is like a border that's about the height of a man's hand. All right? So that anything on the table wouldn't just roll off. So it had like an edge on it, on the end of the table. Think of like a pool table that has the bumpers, Right? So the, the ball would roll, but it won't roll off the table. Okay, so you got that kind of there. All right. Um, and then he says, uh, and he made crowns around it. And that border was made of pure gold. In verse 13, it says, and he cast for it four rings of gold. All right. So once again, we see these rings. And then in verse um, uh, 14, we see some more talking about the rings. And then in verse 15, we're going to see the staffs. Now, why again are we making the rings and the staffs? So we can bring this table what? With us. To make it what? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I, I, you, 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 you missed me here. Uh, I don't understand. What, is, what was the crown? The, the crown was the, uh, the edge of the table had like a, uh, uh, um, a lift on it. You think of like a pool table, right? And the pool table, the pool table has those bumpers around it. That's what that crown was kind of like. It was, the, the table had like a crown around it. They kind of lift up so that the the the, the flat okay, portion of the crown. table, you got it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And so that's why it's called the crown around the table. All right. And, and, it, and remember that table, if something fell off, you couldn't touch it. Hmm. Mm. Well, the, well, we're, we're gonna get about what's on there in a minute. But that crown was made of what? Pure gold. That's important. But then it also says that it was, in verse 15, it says that uh, it, we made the staffs. Uh, and, and in verse 13 and 14, it talks about the rings. And we saw that that, once again, was for what? To make it portable. Because you want to bring this table, you're going to bring this table with you so you can carry it. Now, why do we need this table? What, what, what's, what's in the importance of the table? Well, this table... Look at verse 16. And he made the vessels which were on, upon the table, his dishes, his spoons, and his bowls, and his, and, and his cover to cover with all of pure gold. Now, it just kind of goes through that, but on the table were dishes and spoons and bowls. What, what is this for? That's what you use to eat out of. Because this is the table of showbread. This is where the, 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 the showbread went. Uh, the scripture tells us in Revelation that when we go back to meet the Lord, we're going to meet him and we're going to sit with him 
at the uh, at the uh, uh, the, the uh, supper of the Lamb, the Lamb's supper. In other words, we're going to sit and have an eternal dinner. Um, and you're like, well, what what does that mean? I, I can't tell you. I have, <laughs> I have no idea. I just know that Jesus said when he when he drank the wine with his disciples, he said, "I'm not going to drink any more wine until I drink it with you fresh and new." Where? And my kingdom. That's right. And my kingdom. And, and my father's kingdom. And so that's a dinner and a time. So this bread speaks to that. Uh, um, this table speaks to that. On the table is bread. All right. Well, we know in the Ark of the Covenant is another kind of item that we eat, and that was manna. On this table, on the other side, not in the Holy of Holies, but in the holy place, we have what? Regular bread. That, that goes on there. And so it's, it speaks to, you have to come to the table of the Lord to eat. So we are to be what? Devouring God's word. That's what we're doing now. We're eating. We're feeding our what? Spirit, our soul. Uh, when the disciples came to Jesus, when he was with the woman at the, at the well, and they went to the city to get him some food to eat. And they came back and they looked upon him and they were like, did somebody bring him some food? He looked like he's full. And then he told his disciples, I have food to eat that you know not of. Mm -hmm. So he's like, no, I have a different kind of food. Now, you can't, the spirit of God can be on you to the point where you don't have any natural appetite. God can just remove that and have you hunger only for the things of God. Yes, sir. All right, and that's an important aspect, and that's the beauty of this. So this table represents that, that association. And on there, there are things. You need things to help you to devour. You need the spoon and the dishes and the bowls. So you got to use the various things that God has provided. Use your intelligence. Use your wit. Use your whatever it is that God has given to you to help you to uh, associate and to bring the word that bread into you. All right, and so all the things that you use to help devour and, abs uh, and absorb the word are all made of what? Pure gold. It's valuable. You have when you go and you find means in which you can bring the word of God into you. That means becomes extremely valuable, and you should not count it as something that's just. Don't mean nothing. No, it's important. All right. Uh, verse 17, we see this other item. And he made the candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work. Uh, made he the candlestick. Uh, and then he talks about the shafts and his branches and his bowls and the knots and the flowers uh, were of the same. And, it's, and, and in verse uh, 18, it says, and there are six branches going out to the side thereof, three branches of the candlestick out to one side, and three branches of the candlestick out to the other side. All right? And then there's, a, there's another uh, portion of the main portion of the candlestick that goes right up the middle. All right? Um, this candlestick, candlestick speaks of what? The light. Okay? Now, Jesus says... I am the what? I am the, the light, light of, the world. of the world. Okay. So you, you, you have the word of God, but the word of God should, be, once it's in you, it should begin to what? Illuminate and bring light. Now, all of this stuff that we're talking about now, this, the, the table of showbread and the candlestick, this is in the holy place. These are also separated from the out of court. So not, this is not something that everybody sees just because they come into the tabernacle. you got to come into the tabernacle, go pra, pra, past the brazen altar, pra, past the, 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 the bronze basin, and then through the curtains, and then you come into the holy place. And in the holy place is where you will see these items. All right? And then the other veil is where you see the... Uh, is this... Is this is this one part of the of the holies of holies where the priests would go? Uh, well, this is not part of the holy of holies. This is part of the holy place. So, if you think about the once again, you think about the uh, 
the structure in the court is made of two compartments, the Holy of Holies, and, and in there is the Ark of the Covenant. And then you got the holy place. Now, when the priests went into the Holy of Holies, they went in there with bells and all that kind of stuff. And if they, uh, and if they weren't properly uh, uh, anointed and properly prepared by the, following the instructions of God, they would drop dead. And, um, but, uh, but you know what? Let me correct myself. They would, they would drop dead even if they went into the holy place. Because that's where they would, that's where they would be, you know, uh, begin to offer up all the different things. You know, they would light the candles and all that stuff. But um, and we'll we'll get to that as well. But the candlestick is important um, because it brings forth light. All right. And so what we see here with the candlestick is number one, it has six branches. Three on one side, three on the other side, and then it has a main branch in the middle. So it has seven branches. It has seven places to put to put lights. Um, boy, I could spend a lot of time, and we're going to get to that, which is why I'm not going to do it now, about these the, the, the seven times that light can be given. Um, it's so important. When we were in the book of Revelation, we talked a little bit about this. Because when Jesus spoke, how many different churches are there in, in, in the world? There are millions and millions of churches, but he only uh, isolated them to a description of how many? Seven. seven. So he spoke to the seven churches because there was, there, it speaks of that seven light-giving aspects. All right? And so when all of them are lit, it's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful light. The problem that you have is when the light goes what? Goes out. And Jesus said to the seven churches that if you don't follow the instructions that I'm giving you, I'm going to turn out your light. And so we see on here that he's, these things, these things called snuffers and, and various things. Now, um, in the description of the candlestick, one of the things that we see here, um, uh, let's see, what was the best place to look at that? Verse 19, it says, it talks about the, the three bowls. It says, three bowls were made after the fashion of almonds on one branch, uh, a knob and a flower, all right? And three bowls uh, made like almonds in the other branch, a knob and the flower. So uh, throughout the six branches going out of the candlestick. So, the candlestick was made of pure gold, but it was made to look like what? Branches, tree branches. Specifically, tree branches that bring forth what? Flowers and bring forth what? Almonds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the thing that brings the light is depicted as a tree or a, 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 a branch. Okay. Um, what else was in the Garden of Eden? We know there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but there was some other tree there. What was that called? The tree of life. All right? And so the tree of life uh, speaks to our ability to have illumination and the things of God uh, eternally. So that's why God said we have to move man out of the garden, lest they eat of the tree of life and be in that state, what? Forever. Forever. All right? So it's important to keep in mind that the thing that gives us light, this light, uh, um, is, is, is depicted as a tree. And um, light is important because it allows us to be able to discern direction. I can discern um, impediments. Uh, when you're driving in a car at night, you need what? Headlights. Why? To make sure that you're able to see if there's any problems where? In front of you. And that's what this light's about. It's letting us know that you're going to be on a journey that you're going to need to see. And that's why Jesus came. He said, I am the light. 
And why? Because they, he, he's coming into a world where there is a problem and there are issues that you need to be aware of. If you're not aware of these issues, you will run into them. So light's important. And the fact that he describes it as a plant means that light helps bring light. But if you don't have light, it can kill you. If you're driving at night and you don't have your headlights on, you are a what? A dangerous person. Not only to yourself, but also to what? To others. others. And that's why we need the light. And so that's why Jesus said he came to what? To give us light. He said, I am the what? Light of the world. All right. And so it talks a lot about the description and it continues. And we can see in verse 20, it talks about those four bowls. It talks about the almonds and the knots. It does the same thing in verse 21. It talks about those two branches and the knots and, the, and it's just giving descriptions of how this thing looks like a, like, like a branch. Verse 22, it, said, it talks about the knots and, it, and how it's all made of, of one beaten work of gold. Okay? And then in verse 23, it talks about the snuffers. And, and the snuff dishes and all and that's the thing so when you were lighting the candle and you want to take the light out you 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 would then take the snuffer and you would put it over the lamp over the, the candle and the light would then go out right? and that was made of pure gold and in verse 24 it talks about the uh of a talent of pure gold he made it made all the vessels thereof so it just gives us the weight of the gold that is made of and the light was uh, uh the candlestick what had no wood in it. It was pure gold. Okay. So then we get to verse 25 and we get to another mm -hmm. item that is in the holy place. And he said, and he made the incense altar of sitting wood and gives us the length and the breadth and, and the height thereof. And then in verse 26, it says, and he overlaid it with pure gold. All right. And then, um, he says, and the sides thereof around about were horns. All right, so th this was a table. Uh, it was uh, is described as the incense altar, and it's made of pure. It's, it's, it's made of of, of uh, shit and wood overlaid with pure gold. All right, so it's important to keep in mind. And then he has these crowns or these horns on the edge of the on the ends of the table. All right. And then in verse 27 and verse 28, we see once again, that same table also has its what? Its rings and its staffs because it's, to, it's supposed to be what? Portable. Portable. Mm -hmm. All right. So what is this all about? Well, this is where the incense was burned. So, you, so, so we, we saw earlier in a few other chapters, God gave a, uh, the ingredients on how to make the incense and said, if you make this incense for any other purpose than to burn it in the uh, uh, the holy place, that you would be uh, cut off. That incense is only supposed to be burnt and given up that the aroma to God. So what does that speak of? It speaks of our prayers. When we when we saw John up in heaven, he said he saw the incense in heaven, and he said these are the what. The prayers of the saints. So it lets us know that we're we when we're praying, we are operating inside the altar, inside the tabernacle. That's a better word, not the altar, but inside inside the tabernacle of God. Praying is something that we do as being part of our relationship in Christ. So when we're in Christ, we can pray. So um the uh, the instructions that we were given when Jesus was uh, given the instructions on how to pray, he says, uh, "Pray after this this manner." But what he what he uh, uh, said it was that our Father, which is what in heaven, hallowed be thy name. All right. So already talked about his what his holiness. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our what daily bread. We talked about the bread. All right, already it is there. And lead us not into what? Temptation, Temptation. but deliver us from evil. That's a what? That's a prayer. That speaks to the altar of incense. All right? 
And so we can see that even in that prayer, he, he, he touches on the items that are in the tabernacle. That is how we build our relationship. Through the eating of the bread, which is the word, following the given light that the Lord gives, and then going to him in prayer. And when we do that, we will then be ready to enter into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant, where we receive mercy, and where we recognize the great holiness of God. Those are just beautiful things and beautiful outlines that show us um, the things of God. Um, let me just read this last verse. It's important um, before we close here. It says, And he made the holy anointing oil and the pure incense of sweet spices according to the work of the apothecary. So in other words, he did it by instruction. I didn't make it any kind of way I wanted to make. I didn't take my own recipe. I made it according to how it was given to me. By who? By God. The anointing oil, once again, speaks of our ability to be aided in prayer by what? Or by who? By the Holy Spirit. All right? Because the scripture says that we don't know oftentimes how to pray, but we get aided and we get helped by the Spirit of God mm -hmm. to know what to pray for and what to pray about. Because a lot of times we don't know what to pr pray about. And like I, how we, we were talking about uh, our, in our Wednesday study, uh, Job, he's praying about his pain. He's praying about his hurt. And not to say that that's not something that we should pray about, but our ultimate prayer should be about our relationship. That's the most important thing. My relationship with God. Because if my relationship with God is right, my hurt and pain don't matter. Mm -hmm. Because I can understand, and, and, and you know what, we can, uh, we can, if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, that same chapter talked about uh, what Paul said, he knows that if my earthly body be dissolved, that, that I have a, a, another body not made with hands. But then he said, to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Present with the Lord. So he wasn't worried about this. So he's saying, I'm going to let God take care of the preserving of the natural body. My focus is that I worship and serve him and know him that I can receive a body not made by hands. So what we are going through here is a tabernacle that's made by hands. Bezalel is gifted, and he's anointed, and God instructed him, and he was told what to do by God through Moses, and Bezalel is doing it. But this is a tabernacle made by what? Made by hands. We have another tabernacle that we now have now, and it's a tabernacle that was formed from the dust and from the clay made by God, but was what? corrupted and had found in its spot and wrinkle can no longer be offered to God. That's why this tabernacle has to be what? Dissolved. And we're going to have a new tabernacle when we get to, in, into heaven. But through all the sacrifices and all the, uh, uh, the offerings that are made, this corrupted tabernacle can interact with God for a time, I can get a temporary covering. And that's what all of this that we're going to go through in Exodus and in Numbers and in Leviticus. All of that is showing our ability to have a relationship with God while I'm yet in a corrupted tabernacle. All right, my tabernacle has got spot and, and wrinkles and everything in it. But if I follow the guidance of God and use the things that he placed here, the prayer, the light, and the word, I can still relate to God and come into his presence because of his mercy. But there will come a time when I will just be in God's presence and will no longer need a sacrifice because the sacrifice has already been what? Given. I will no longer need to uh, uh, ask for forgiveness of sin because sin will already have been removed and paid for. That's where we're heading. That's where we're going. So as you can see, and we're, we're, we're done with that chapter, and we, we'll, we'll pick up some more uh, 
with, with a lot more detail in our next chapter. Uh, you think, okay, that's a lot of detail. No, it's going to get even more detail in the next chapter. All these little things that we, we forget about that are part of the tabernacle uh, that are there. Um, and we're going to talk about those next week. All right, so we're going to stop here. Any other comments or questions? Or, 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 or? Yeah, yeah I, I, I have a comment. Yes, sir. Well, let me say, let me, let me say this way. The reason why certain portions I mentioned is because I know we're going to get back to that again. So, uh, I, what I'm trying not to be is redundant. Um, and, and, and I, and I don't want to, to rush through it. I don't, I think I'm taking my time, but yes, I could have spent, I could have spent the whole week on, on, on verse, uh, uh, 17, you know, talking about the candlestick. But we're going to talk about that some more. And next, next week, we're going to get into some more, even greater detail on some of these things. Um, so what I'm trying to do sometimes, you know how you give like an overview of a book, then you actually give the, you know, the breakdown of chapters, and then you actually get into the actual reading. So this is kind of like a chapter breakdown of some of the stuff in the tabernacle. We're going to get next week into some more stuff. We're going to be looking at, you know, uh, uh, how this stuff actually operates. Okay, what do you do? With the altar, what do you do with the uh, uh, the incense um, uh, altar? What do you do with the candlesticks? How do you apply it? How does it operate? We're gonna get to see some more of that. But if I if I spent all the time talking about it, I'd have to I'd have to step into chapter thirty eight, which we're not there yet. Amen. So we got to get to thirty eight before I can actually spend the time to talk about all of that. <laughs> That's the only reason. Now, when I feel like I can stop, I. I, I will spend some time. And yes, I'm not perfect, man. I'm, I, I'm probably got some things I could do better. I, I, I definitely will admit that. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's not. No, that's not. Don't get into the. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying if you get to when you say, I can stay on this for, you know, stay on it. I'm just saying stay on it. You want to hear that's more. What I'm, you sound like a person that's hungry. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's like I didn't get all my food. I get you. I get you. There's more to come but, to keep you hungry. You know, I don't know if everybody else feels like that, but, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. if you feel like you can get to somewhere in the chapter, you say, oh, I'm going to listen to y'all. We're not going to finish this chapter because I have something to say. I mean, God is putting it there for you to say as far as I'm concerned, so I'm just saying, you know, give it to us. I'm going to give it to you. Well, let me tell you this. Next week, we're going to be talking about some, like I said, we're going to get into some, some real detail. We're going to talk about the, 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 some of the hooks and the, and the pillars Just and all the different stay hungry. Things. But uh, what, I'm, what I'm happy about, I'm, I'm, I think your complaint is a good complaint. It's, st it's telling me you're hungry. Now stay hungry. And uh, <laughs> so there's nothing, nothing a, a person likes than to serve good food to, to hungry people. <laughs> Okay. So I don't mind it at all, sir. I don't mind. I, I don't mind it at, at all. So I certainly will continue to try to do that. All right, and I and I take what you're saying um, seriously. Okay, I appreciate that. Anybody else? 